RMS Titanic, a British passenger liner operated by the White Star Line, met a tragic fate in the North Atlantic Ocean. The ship sank after colliding with an iceberg during its maiden voyage from Southampton, England, to New York City. This disaster remains the deadliest peacetime sinking of an ocean liner or cruise ship. The Titanic, built by the Harland and Wolfe shipyard in Belfast, Northern Ireland, was an impressive vessel measuring 882 feet and 9 inches in length with a maximum breadth of 92 feet and 6 inches. It featured 10 decks, each serving various purposes, from accommodating lifeboats on the boat deck to housing first-class cabins and public spaces on the promenade and saloon decks. The ship carried a diverse range of passengers, including affluent individuals and numerous immigrants seeking a new life in America and Canada. Despite its significant impact on literature and film, the sinking of the Titanic remains an enigmatic event in history. Here are 15 preserved photos of the Titanic before it sank. Number 15. The Boy on the Titanic's Deck In the iconic 1997 film Titanic, there is a scene depicting a young boy engrossed in playing with a spinning top on the ship's deck. Interestingly, this scene is a recreation of a real photograph taken on board the Titanic. The photograph was captured on one of the upper decks of the Titanic just days before the ill-fated vessel met its tragic end. The date was April 11, 1912. The photograph shows a six-year-old boy named Robert Douglas Spedden, joyfully engaged in spinning his top, while his father and other passengers observed the scene. Young Robert was a first-class passenger from a wealthy family. Robert, accompanied by his family, was aboard the Titanic, returning to their residence in Tuxedo Park, New York, following a family excursion through Algeria. But what befell this young boy? Well, he was fast asleep when the Titanic collided with the iceberg. Amidst the chaos of the sinking, he briefly awoke as his nurse, Elizabeth Burns, assured him that she would take him on a trip to see the stars. Robert is said to have drifted back to sleep, unaware of the unfolding tragedy. When he eventually awoke the following morning, he found himself in a lifeboat, having survived the calamity. Sadly, Robert's story took a tragic turn. In 1915, at the tender age of nine, he met an untimely demise after being struck by a car in Maine. Considering the limited number of automobiles on the roads during that time, his accident stands as one of the earliest recorded automobile-related incidents in the state's history. Number 14. The Iceberg That Sank the Titanic It is widely known that the sinking of the Titanic was caused by an iceberg. Well, check this out. Just two days before the disaster, the captain of another ship crossing the Atlantic happened to snap an incredible black-and-white picture of a massive iceberg. And get this. It's believed to be the very iceberg that brought down the Titanic. This seaman, Captain W. Wood, served on the SS Etonian, a British merchant ship, and had a passion for photography. Luckily, he had his camera handy and managed to capture the enormity of that iceberg. But here's the really interesting part. Captain Wood made sure to jot down the exact coordinates of the iceberg. Those coordinates were almost identical to where the Titanic hit an iceberg and tragically sank claiming the lives of 1,522 people. Once Captain Wood reached New York, he wasted no time getting the photograph developed. He even sent a print of it to his great-grandfather, along with a letter declaring that this very iceberg was the one responsible for the Titanic's demise. In fact, he wrote a caption in bold black ink on the photo itself, saying, Iceberg taken by Captain Wood S.S. Etonian in 41 degrees 50 minutes north latitude and 49 degrees 50 minutes west longitude on April 12th at 4 p.m. We all know that the Titanic struck an iceberg at 10.20 p.m. on April 14th, 1912, and sank within three hours. Over the past century, several other photos of icebergs near the Titanic's path have surfaced, taken both before and after the collision. However, what makes Captain Wood's photograph so intriguing is that the shape of the iceberg in his picture closely matches the sketches and descriptions given by eyewitnesses of the iceberg that ultimately spelled doom for the Titanic. Number 13. Third Class Passengers This next photo offers a glimpse into the experience of third class passengers, also known as steerage passengers, settling aboard the Titanic. On the Titanic, third-class passengers shared communal bathrooms, 
dined together in dedicated dining facilities, and slept in cabins with four occupants per room. Despite being considered third class, the accommodations provided for these passengers on the Titanic were remarkably good compared to what they were accustomed to back home. In fact, the living conditions on the Titanic's third-class section were said to resemble second-class accommodations on other steamships, although the space allocated to third-class passengers was relatively small and they had access to very few amenities. One notable perk for third-class passengers was that they were provided with meals, a significant improvement compared to many other steamships of the time, which required steerage passengers to bring their own food. While the third-class accommodations were situated in less desirable areas of the ship, closer to the noise and vibrations of the engines, the cabins on the Titanic's third-class section boasted running water and electricity. Single men were housed in the bow of the ship, while single women and families were accommodated in the stern section, where larger cabins were available for families. The cabins, although spacious by the standards of the time, had irregular shapes to align with the curvature of the ship's bow and stern. In addition to the cabins, the Titanic provided a general room for steerage passengers to gather, relax, read, play cards, and engage in various activities to pass the time. While they were not permitted access to other entertainment areas such as the gymnasium or the pool, steerage passengers had the opportunity to organize their own parties and dances. The majority of the 700-plus steerage passengers aboard the Titanic were emigrants. They were hoping to start a new life in America, and the Titanic was their ticket to a better future. Unfortunately, many of them never made it to their destination. Only 25% of the third-class passengers on the Titanic survived the tragedy, and even among that small percentage, only a fraction were men. Number 12. Titanic's Gymnasium The Titanic boasted its own gymnasium, a remarkable feature for an ocean liner of its time. Situated on the vessel's boat deck near the Grand Staircase, this facility was described as a marvel of innovation. Upon entering, Passengers were greeted by a brightly lit room adorned with white-painted oak paneling and tiled floors. A notable spot was a carved oak installation on the opposite wall, showcasing an illustrated cutaway of an Olympic-class ocean liner and a map depicting the travel routes of the White Star Line across the globe. The gymnasium was equipped with state-of-the-art exercise equipment, including electric camels, an electric horse, rowing machines, punching bags, weightlifting machines, and mechanical bicycles. First-class passengers could obtain tickets, priced at one shilling from the purser. This granted them access to the exclusive facility for a single session. Assisting the passengers in using the equipment was the gymnasium's permanent physical educator, T.W. Macaulay. Operating during specified hours, the gymnasium, like other recreational areas aboard the Titanic, maintained gender and age segregation policies. The White Star Line, the shipping company responsible for the Titanic's construction, promoted the gymnasium as a space where passengers could indulge in the action of horse riding, cycling, boat rowing, and obtain both beneficial exercise as well as endless amusement. One particularly popular attraction was the Electric Camel, an exercise riding machine that replicated the movement of a camel. Tragically, on the night the Titanic sank, T.W. Macaulay, the physical educator, remained in the gymnasium and perished with the ship. Number 11. Titanic's Life Vests This photo is part of a passenger's album who disembarked the Titanic before its sinking. The Titanic was equipped with life vests for all passengers on board, ensuring there were enough for the more than 2,000 individuals, including crew members. These life vests were constructed with canvas and cork. Although their design was flimsy, secured only by fabric strings, they proved to be surprisingly heavy but highly buoyant. Tragically, as the Titanic sank, many passengers who couldn't access lifeboats resorted to jumping off the ship's railings or sides. Unfortunately, due to the vest design, the impact of hitting the water caused unconsciousness for many jumpers. Consequently, numerous individuals drowned, suffered broken necks, or succumbed to hypothermia in the freezing waters. Following the tragedy, cork continued to be the primary material for life vests, but improvements were made in their design only after World War II. The loss of passengers wearing cork life vests on the Titanic and similar incidents served as a driving force for enhancing the materials used in life vests. 
Despite their flawed designs, a few original Titanic life jackets still exist today. Interestingly, the faults haven't deterred bidders from participating in auctions for these artifacts. In fact, one of these Titanic life jackets fetched an astonishing price of $119,000. Number 10. The Swimming Pool The White Star Line, the company responsible for building and owning the Titanic, had previously introduced the concept of a swimming pool on their ship, the RMS Adriatic, launched in 1906. Thus, when designing the Titanic, White Star aimed to enhance its previous design by incorporating a pool, referred to as a swimming bath. In 1912, the presence of a swimming pool on the Titanic was considered a novel and luxurious feature, highlighting the opulence found aboard the ship. The swimming pool on the Titanic was located inside the ship on the starboard side of F-deck. The pool had a constant depth of six feet, with the water typically filled between the five and six foot marks to allow for some movement. It was filled with heated salt water and was exclusively accessible to first-class passengers. However, its use came with a charge, and men and women were not permitted to bathe simultaneously. A specific time window was allocated for men to swim free of charge from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., while any other time required payment. On the other hand, women had to pay each time they decided to swim, without the benefit of a designated free period. Children were not allowed to utilize the pool. Swimming in the Titanic's pool came with a cost of approximately 25 cents per person. The cost even included the provision of a bathing suit. Colonel Archibald Gracie, a passenger on the Titanic, enjoyed a swim in the pool roughly 24 hours before the ship's tragic sinking. He described the warm salt water as invigorating and had planned to swim again the following morning. Fortunately, he survived the disaster by clinging to one of the collapsible lifeboats until rescue arrived. Number 9. The Insufficient Lifeboats Since the tragic sinking of the Titanic, the inadequate number of lifeboats on board has been widely regarded as a major factor contributing to the high death toll. This hauntingly prophetic photograph taken by Reverend F. M. Brown, a passenger who disembarked the ill-fated ship after its short voyage from Southampton to Queenstown, England, captures the Titanic's bridge and one of its lifeboats. Numerous inquiries conducted both domestically and internationally following the Titanic disaster concluded that proper regulations could have prevented the incident. In terms of technical compliance, the Titanic adhered to the Merchant Shipping Act of 1894, which was in effect at the time of the ship's sinking, according to the Library of Congress. The law stipulated that ships weighing over 10,000 tons were required to have 16 lifeboats capable of accommodating 990 people. However, the Titanic, as the largest ship of its time, weighing nearly 50,000 tons, surpassed these regulations. It carried a total of 20 lifeboats, which provided enough capacity for approximately half of the individuals on board the night of the sinking. Before the Titanic disaster, lifeboats were not regarded as a substitute for the entire ship. The massive liner itself, with its 16 watertight compartments, was expected to remain afloat even after taking on water. Out of the more than 2,000 people on board, the Titanic, only around 700 managed to board lifeboats. Furthermore, the lifeboats were launched with fewer occupants than their capacity allowed, as there was concern that the mechanism lowering the boats could fail if they were fully loaded. For example, the first lifeboat to depart from the Titanic had a capacity for 65 people, but launched with only 25 occupants. Surprisingly, no lifeboat or fire drills were conducted before the ship's sinking. It is shocking to note that a lifeboat drill had been planned for the morning of the Titanic's sinking, but was reportedly canceled by Captain John Smith, who wished to conduct one final Sunday service before his retirement. Just two years after the Titanic disaster, the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, Solus implemented a requirement for all passenger ships to carry lifeboats for every individual on board. Today, Solus mandates that ships must have lifeboats with a capacity of 125% of the ship's total capacity. Number 8. Titanic's Captain and Purser This image captures Captain Edward J. Smith, the British captain of the Titanic, alongside the ship's purser, Hugh Walter McElroy. The photograph was taken by a passenger who disembarked from the ship in Queenstown, Ireland, three days before the tragic sinking. 
Sadly, both Captain Smith and the purser lost their lives in the disaster. Three days after the Titanic embarked on its maiden voyage from Southampton, England, Captain Edward J. Smith followed his typical Sunday routine. He conducted an inspection of the ship, but chose not to carry out a scheduled safety drill. He led a worship service and then held a meeting with his officers to determine the ship's position. Based on their calculations, the Titanic was maintaining an impressive speed of 22 knots. As the evening of April 14, 1912 approached, the temperature dropped to freezing and the North Atlantic's surface appeared calm and mirror-like, making it difficult to spot icebergs, which were common in that region during spring. Despite these conditions, Captain Smith maintained full speed, believing that the crew could respond promptly if any icebergs were sighted. However, on the night of April 14th, he was not on the bridge when the ship collided with an iceberg. Upon learning of the damage, he immediately requested an assessment from Thomas Andrews, the Titanic's designer, who determined that the vessel was destined to sink. At 2.20 a.m. on April 15th, the Titanic met its tragic fate. Captain Smith was last seen on the bridge, and although reports circulated of him saving a drowning child, such claims were largely dismissed. His body was never recovered. Smith's actions during the voyage were later analyzed with differing opinions. Some criticized his decision not to reduce speed, while others argued that based on his experience, he reasonably believed he could maneuver the ship in time to avoid a collision. Questions were also raised regarding his absence from the bridge as the Titanic encountered the ice field. Number 7. The First Class Dining Room The Titanic's dining room holds a remarkable place in history as the largest ever constructed. Its first class dining room could comfortably accommodate over 500 people simultaneously. Spanning the width of the ship with a length of 114 feet, this grand space was elegantly themed in white offering a setting where the affluent could dine and socialize. The culinary offerings in the dining room were nothing short of exquisite, rivaling those fit for a palace. The menu boasted delicacies such as succulent lobster, Egyptian quails, juicy peaches, fine caviar, and luscious grapes. The fruits were fresh and the food was prepared by chefs catering to the refined palates of the wealthiest passengers. Breakfast was served from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., luncheon from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., and dinner from 7 p.m. to 8.15 p.m. Passengers were alerted to mealtimes by the ship's bugler, Peter W. Fletcher, playing the roast beef of Old England. Dinner was an elegant affair, with gentlemen dressed in dinner suits and ladies adorned in the latest fashion, accompanied by the scent of imported exotic perfumes and showcasing their finest jewelry. One particularly favored dining spot on the ship was the A La Carte restaurant, exclusively reserved for first-class passengers. The design of the dining room was inspired by British architecture. It featured comfortable oak seats and tables. Every corner of this exclusive section was adorned with luxurious furnishings, combining both comfort and elegance. To further enhance the ambiance, an orchestra played in the background as the wealthy passengers enjoyed their meals. The soothing music created an atmosphere of serenity, allowing them to unwind and enjoy their dining experience to the fullest. Number 6. A Compromised Hull? This picture captures the construction of the Titanic's hull, the body of the ship. Similar to other structures of its time, the Titanic's hull was held together by over 3 million iron and steel rivets weighing over 1,200 tons. These rivets were either fitted using hydraulic machines or hammered in by hand. The Titanic's hull featured a double bottom for added strength, but the sides had a single wall. It consisted of 15 sections that could be sealed off with the flip of a switch. However, the bulkheads dividing these sections had multiple access doors to enhance luxury service. In recent years, Irish journalist Senan Molony has put forward a theory suggesting that the Titanic's hull was compromised weeks before its maiden voyage. Through the research of photos and eyewitness accounts from the time, Molony argues that a fire broke out spontaneously in one of the Titanic's massive coal bunkers, significantly weakening a crucial part of the hull. As the crew stored coal for the engines close to the hull, the intense heat from the fire would have directly affected the ship's structure. Consequently, when the Titanic collided with an iceberg, 
the compromised steel hull proved vulnerable, resulting in the rupture of the ship's lining. Molony's theory has faced skepticism. Over time, various alternative explanations for the sinking of the Titanic have been proposed, ranging from being struck by a torpedo from a German U-boat to being cursed by an Egyptian mummy. While a coal fire seems more plausible than a mythical curse, some still strongly believe that the iceberg was the primary cause of the ship's sinking. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. In this intriguing photograph, we see Captain Edward J. Smith, the British captain of the Titanic, alongside the ship's purser, Hugh Walter McElroy. They stand together on the Titanic's deck, their expressions hinting at a depth of thoughts and emotions. As we gaze upon this snapshot frozen in time, we can't help but wonder, what might have been going through their minds at that very moment? What thoughts and concerns occupied their thoughts as the photo was taken? Drop your comments below. Number 5. The Titanic's Construction The Titanic was purposefully constructed by White Star Shipping to stand out among its commercial shipping liners, catering to the growing demand for travel between Europe and the United States. Although numerous ships already provided regular Atlantic crossings, White Star Shipping was resolute in its mission to captivate travelers by creating the most magnificent and awe-inspiring liner of its time. Construction on the Titanic commenced on March 31, 1909 at the Harland and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast, where its sister ship, Olympic, was also being built. The colossal size of both ships posed a significant engineering challenge for Harland and Wolf, as no shipbuilder had ever attempted to construct vessels of such magnitude. To accommodate the Titanic and Olympic, three existing slipways were demolished, and two new ones, the largest of their kind at the time, were constructed. During the peak of construction, approximately 14,000 workers were employed by Harland and Wolf to build these immense ships. The framing of the Titanic took over a year to complete, with the shell plating finished in October 1910. In the 1990s, some material scientists theorized that the steel plates used for the ship were prone to brittleness in cold conditions, which worsened the impact damage and expedited the sinking. While the quality of the steel plates was considered good by the standards of the time, it was not up to par with later decades' advancements in steelmaking metallurgy for shipbuilding purposes. Throughout the construction of the Titanic, many tasks were carried out without safety equipment such as hard hats or hand guards on machinery. As a result, there were 246 recorded injuries, 20 of which were classified as severe, including severed arms and legs crushed by falling steel components. Six individuals lost their lives on the ship itself during construction and outfitting, while an additional two fatalities occurred in the shipyard workshops and sheds. Shortly before the ship's launch, a worker tragically died when struck by a falling piece of wood. Number 4. Launching the Titanic At 12.15 p.m. on May 31, 1911, the Titanic was launched into the water by Robert Falconer Keith, head foreman shipwright at Harland & Wolf. The momentous event drew an enormous crowd of over 100,000 people, as captured in this picture and well as this other one. Among them were a few dignitaries, including J. Pierpont Morgan and J. Bruce Ismay, who observed from a specially constructed grandstand. Keith released the hydraulic triggers that held the ship in place, allowing it to glide into the River Lagan. To facilitate the smooth launch, 22 tons of soap and tallow were applied to the slipway, providing lubrication for the ship's journey. Following the White Star Line's tradition, the ship was not officially named or christened with champagne. It was then towed to a fitting out berth where, over the next year, the engines, funnels, superstructure, and interior of the ship were installed. After the maiden voyage of the Olympic in June 1911, some minor modifications were made to the Titanic's design. These adjustments made the Titanic slightly heavier than its sister ship, allowing it to claim the title of the largest ship in the world. The construction process took longer than anticipated due to design changes and a temporary pause caused by repairs needed for the Olympic, which had been involved in a collision on September 1911. If the Titanic had been completed earlier, it may have avoided the fatal collision with the iceberg. In early April 1912, the Titanic underwent sea trials, after which the ship was deemed seaworthy. 
Number 3. The room captured in this picture is known as the First Class Reading and Writing Room. Originally intended as a ladies' retreat after dinner, it served as a serene space on A deck for relaxation, reading, and writing letters home. Situated on the port side of the corridor connecting the grand staircase to the lounge, it was primarily frequented by women. Although men were also allowed to use it, few to none of them did. The room was divided into two sections, a spacious main area and a smaller seating alcove on the right, separated by a doorway adorned with Aile de Boeuf windows. Elevated above the boat deck, it boasted tall windows reaching 11 feet in height. Pink silk curtains adorned these windows, allowing abundant sunlight to fill the space. Adorned in refined Georgian decorative style, the room showcased intricate plasterwork, sleek paneling, fluted columns, and a white marble fireplace. Potted palms added a touch of greenery, while shaded sconces and crystal chandeliers provided gentle illumination. Comfortable settees and chairs upholstered in silk, with hues of yellow and blue, were arranged around tables and writing desks. The reading and writing room operated from 8 a.m. to 11.30 p.m., aligning with the hours of the neighboring first-class lounge. Passengers could borrow books from the lounge and use the writing desks to pen letters home or send postcards, with all mail being posted at Cherbourg, France, and Queenstown, Ireland. Unfortunately, the reading and writing room saw little activity, with passengers failing to grasp its purpose and intention. Today, it remains unexplored or damaged due to the ship's destruction and the subsequent collapse of the deck above. Interestingly, remnants of the room, including a yellow sofa and a pink chair, were discovered on the beaches of Newfoundland. This suggests that someone may have accessed the room, removed some furniture, and discarded it into the ocean, with the intention of using them as makeshift rafts or floating devices. Number 2. The Second Class Dining Room The second class dining room aboard the Titanic was a large and elegant space located on D-Deck. It could seat up to 394 passengers at once, with long tables stretching across the room as depicted in this photo. The mahogany furniture, upholstered in crimson, added a touch of sophistication to the setting. To ensure stability during rough weather, the long tables and mahogany swivel chairs were securely bolted to the floor. Meals in the second-class dining room were prepared in the first and second-class galley, which also catered to the larger first-class dining saloon on the same deck. As passengers enjoyed their meals, a band entertained them with music, both during and after dining, creating a pleasant atmosphere. Interestingly, a lesser-known fact about the second-class dining room is that trays for serving were not available. Due to the Titanic's rushed completion, some details were left unfinished. As a result, waiters had to carry the food bowl by bowl, leading to delays and occasionally resulting in lukewarm dishes. This situation was a point of complaint for passengers like Imanita Shelley, who expressed frustration with the disarray in the second-class area. Despite these challenges, the second-class dining room on the Titanic still exuded a sense of elegance and provided a gathering place for passengers to enjoy their meals and connect. Number 1. The First-Class Smoking Room The first-class smoking room served as a sophisticated late-night lounge exclusively for first-class male passengers. Here they would gather to socialize, discuss business and politics, indulge in smoking, drinking, and even engage in games of chance except on Sundays. To create an ambiance reminiscent of a gentleman's club, the room was adorned with opulent features, dark mahogany paneling intricately inlaid with mother-of-pearl and exquisitely carved details adorned the walls. Stained glass windows in grand niches illuminated the room from behind, casting a captivating glow. The floor showcased blue and red linoleum tiles, while the plaster ceiling boasted decorative medallions. A focal point of the room was the painting above the centerpiece fireplace titled Approach to the New World, created by Norman Wilkinson. The smoking room attracted both avid gamblers and professional card sharps. At least four professional players were known to be on board the Titanic. Stewards from the adjacent bar catered to passengers' requests for cigars and drinks, enhancing the overall experience. During the tragic sinking, the smoking room held poignant moments for several individuals. In the early hours of the fateful night, just before 2 a.m., Archibald Gracie, an American writer and survivor of the Titanic's sinking, entered the room. He discovered Major Archibald Butt, Francis Davis Millet, 
Clarence Moore and Arthur Ryerson engaged in their final card game at their customary table. William Stead, a prominent British writer and journalist, remained seated, quietly reading a book. Nearby, Emil Tausig, the manager of the West Disinfecting Company, appeared calm, cupping his hands in his lap as he gazed down at the floor, seemingly accepting of the impending events. Around 2.05 a.m., the card players bid farewell, leaving the room. Millet and Major Butt reportedly stayed behind and presumably jumped overboard together. Archibald Gracie exited as well. It's not clear what happened to Mr. Tausig and Mr. Stead, although it is known that they perished in the sinking. We hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one.